My name is Amy Johnson, and I am going to be talking you to, to you today about psychology and how knowing, yes, um, the mic is just recording for them to put it on, yeah. All right, so about the brain side of kids' ministry, is that better? Can you hear me okay now? Okay. Um, oh, I told myself this morning, I'm like, man, I don't talk to big people. I talk to little people. That's what I do. And so, yeah, b- so bear with me. I'm really excited to be, to be here. I want to tell you just a tiny bit about myself. And I went to Northwest University, and my whole plan was to be um, a school counselor. That's what I want. Well, I started out, I wanted to be a teacher. And I got partway through the education program, and I realized that I didn't want to be a teacher anymore. And um, I wanted to be a school counselor. And you have to kind of become a teacher before you can become a school counselor. But I finished up my, thank you so much. I finished up my degree in behavioral science and really dug into um, the heart of a kid and how do kids think. And we're just going to keep it really basic at the beginning and talk about in order to understand and do children's ministry well, it really helps to know how do kids think. Let's see if I... All right, 70%, and I actually checked a couple of some, there was a couple places that said 68, and there I even found one that said 73 per, so I went with one in the middle. Percent of young adults drop out of church at some time and quit their, they're basically, they're being fed, their spiritual feeding and don't come to church anymore. That's not to say that they fall away from the Lord, that was not the study that I looked into, but that they stop attending church, and you know, I was thinking, what if there was a way? What if we could do something to lower that number, to keep more adults in church? And I thought, does it not begin when they're a student? Does it not start when they're a kid? And I really believe that. And as I started to kind of look into this a little bit more, I started to think it all boils down to knowing that two things. The first one is knowing the stages of development. So we're going to go through this kind of quick because most of you, if you've worked with kids for any amount of time, you already know these stages, but we're going to run through them anyway because not everybody has that experience like we just learned about today. And so we're going to go ahead and go through that. But first, the four stages are this. Stage one, infancy. You've got your babies. Stage two, we've got toddlers and preschoolers. Stage three, we've got the school-aged kids. And stage four, we've got the adolescents and the teenagers. Now, before I go into what, the, what these stages mean and what they are, we're going to talk about our focus when we talk about these, these kids and the stages that they're going to is there's this brain thing. What's going on in their head at that time? What do they need from us? How do we reach them? But we don't want it just to stay in their brain. We want to talk about how to take our information that we know about them, the information that we're presenting to them, and how to get that from their brain to their heart. All right, so infancy stage. When a child is born, they begin to bond with others. They begin making those connections. And, um, you know, when I cry, I get fed. When I need something, I cry, and it happens. And they begin to make that, that person who rescues them, so to speak, that person who comes and takes care of them, they begin to bond with that person, making special bonds, and they, um, it helps them to grow. It's an amazing thing. And if you, ha- if you get the, um, the fusion book, there's actually the, a whole chapter on this. So I'm not going to go too much into it because you can totally read it. You can read it up here. Um, But it begins this journey towards their development of self-esteem. And who am I? And who loves me? Who wants to hold me? Who is going to look at me and smile? Who cares about me? You're beginning to make connections, even at that itty-bitty little baby stage. The key to a smooth running church nursery in the eyes of the infant is that the baby's needs are met quickly. That baby is shown love and that baby feels safe. And Honestly, if you're doing those things in your infant ministry, then the moms and dads are going to feel much safer about leaving their children there. And we'll, we'll go back to this a little bit later. Number two, we have the toddler, the preschooler. I am showing independence. I have, um, my sister-in-law has adopted three incredible, I should have put a picture of them in here, incredible 
little people. And um, Cade and Jeannie and Kai are their names. And Cade is four. And he is just in this, he's a little, they were all, they were all drug babies. And so he's maybe developing a little slower than, than some of the others. But when he sees me, he just gets very excited. And he, <laughs> Mimi, there she is. And if he sees me at church, the instant response is, she's going to give me candy. And he will come, and I can get hugs and kisses that nobody else can get. I can get him to pick up trash. I can get him to do all sorts of things. He knows that he's going to get this piece of candy. He is beginning to explore. He's understanding that there's, um, there's responses to the things that I do. It is just a wonderful, a wonderful stage. I love these little toddlers. And, but there is something else about them. They get mad when they don't get their own way, and they get sad when they get into trouble. And that is this thing that's happening in their head. They're growing. They're, they're starting to understand that this is how the world works. And um, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome. Next, we have that toddlers are just growing at this rapid rate. They are like these little sponges. Everything you say to them, everything that they take in, it's just, it's staying there. So you have to be really, really careful at the toddler age. You have to be careful what you say. You have to be careful how you, how aggressive you are. You are making these little life lasting impressions on them. Now I just realized that um, I never passed out my awesome little flyers. Thank you. Okay, that's the next one. there's enough. All right. All right. So toddlers are awesome. They're learning fast. They are learning everything and they're into everything. They want to touch everything. They want to explore everything. They're going to break stuff. You have to have patience with a toddler, but they are so fun. And if you can just grasp, grab, grab a hold of that concept that what I'm teaching is making a difference, even though they may not be able to relay the story back to you. I mean, they're two and three-year-olds. Probably four is your top. You know, maybe your class, your toddler class goes to about four and a half. It's before kindergarten. But they are learning. They are learning so, so, so much. All right. Next, we have our school-age kids. This is the kids from six to 12, and they're on a whole nother journey. They've established, they've learned a lot of things, they know how to communicate with people, but they are on this journey of academic learning. They are still learning at a very rapid rate. They are still like little sponges. They are learning a lot of factual knowledge. They're beginning to ask a lot of questions. How many of you guys in your children's ministry have ever had that kid? Why? How come that did that? <laughs> Why? Can you show me? Can you tell me? Why did you do that? Why did you do that that way? You know, they are learning and they are understanding that when I ask and I get a response, you're going to respond to me and I'm going to learn. And, man, it's hard sometimes that we can't shut those kids down. We really have to listen and love on that kid that asks a lot of questions. So, basically, what is a school-age child looking for? They are longing for a cheerleader. But they are desperately also wanting guidance. So they want somebody to cheer them on to say, hey, you rock. You are awesome. I love your shoes. I mean, they, they want you to notice things. If, if they have a giant bow in their hair that day, you know what? They did that because they want you to notice. They want you to notice them. But they also, they don't want you to, you to let them get away with murder. They don't want to be screamed at or yelled at. They want guidance. They want you to tell them when they're doing something wrong. They want you to send them in the right direction because in their life, this lifelong journey of learning that they are doing, the more guidance that you can give them, the better off that they are going to become. And somewhere deep inside, I've really discovered that they know that. They know that they want guidance. I want to find things out, but I also want to do it on my own. But I can do hard things, so give me a chance. I love, I can't remember the speaker's name that, was, that just spoke. Mark, I loved what Mark said about um, that three to six year old. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to volunteer for and I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to volunteer for everything. That is a lot of your school age kids. 
they want you to put them to work. I, I've learned that the school-age kid, especially the, the fourth and fifth grader, are a great asset to you. They will put out your chairs in the morning. They'll show up early to church to organize things. They will um, type out PowerPoints. They will do all sorts of crazy stuff because they want your approval, because they want a cheerleader. But they also want to sit and be taught because they want guidance. This is, I love, this is my favorite age. I love the school-age kids. Okay, I love them all, actually, so it's kind of a lie. All right, next we have the adolescents, the 13 through 18-year-olds. Is there anybody in here who you are in charge of the adolescents at your church as well as? You have a big job. My husband and I did that for a while. Whew, that was a lot of work. We did, you know, the youth and the kids, but in some ways, if you do it right, you can actually make your, your work a lot easier because you, like, have an in plug to volunteers galore. It's pretty awesome, but it's a lot of work. The 13 to 18-year-old is a very tough age of childhood. It's that age where you're dis- deciding, who in the world am I? What do I believe? What do I think is okay? Where does that boundary line of what I'm walking on, where is that line? My friends are swearing at school, but I don't want to swear at church. And where is my, my line here? What should be coming out of my mouth? Where, what do I believe about relationships? What do I believe about who I am as a person? And I know right now we have huge um, conversations and a really big epidemic of identity issues happening in, in, our, in our young people. And this is that stage where they need us to love on them. And now at my church, I am not in charge of these roller coaster kids, but I do have a huge part in their life because I've believed in them all these years. And I believe that they're, that the youth pastor and the children's pastor have to work together. You have to be a team. You have to support one another. And like, I really, I respect the fact right now that um, Andrew Tolson is the, the, youth pastor at my church, and he never once has ever said to me, can you back off of my youth kids? He lets me use them, and he lets me love on them, and he doesn't take any offense to it, and you know what? If he wants, he came and spoke for me one Sunday when I couldn't, when I had surgery or something, I can't remember what it was, or I was gone or something, and he came and spoke for me, and there becomes that play. Now, he and I are just working on that. We're just beginning that. I really had an awesome relationship of that with Josh Ferry, our old youth pastor at our church. If you can build that relationship with your youth pastor, it can be amazing because if you can understand the mind of a teenager, and I'm not going to read through all of this. You have it on your paper, I believe. Maybe, maybe not, or you can take notes. Um, If you can work through that the high schooler and the middle schooler, they are very insecure. They do not know who they are yet. They are, they are having identity crises all over the place. But if you can get in there and you can be the one that loves them, if you can go to their school and pick them up after school and take them to coffee, if you, I mean, take them roller skating or go ice skating or, you know, go do go do these things. I've been very fortunate to have an in, to have a son in the youth now, but it wasn't always that way. But they learn to just accept you as one of them. And they start to talk freely and openly to you. And maybe, maybe your time is, is really, really valuable and you don't have time for them. Then don't open the dam. Because once you open that dam to say, I'm going to be, I'm going to use these youth kids and I'm going to plug them in and I'm going to give them a place, you really do have to also give them some of your time. You have to be willing to say, I care about you and therefore I'm going to take the time for you because if anybody is going to notice a fake persona of I care about you, it's going to be a youth. And um, you have to love them for real. And the same with middle school. Middle school is like hugely a time of insecurity. Um, I have a middle schooler too, and it's kind of crazy, some of the things that he's going through, some of the things that he's thinking, some of the things that he's seeing, but, but he loves the Lord. And so if you can plant this seed in them, this, this who God is, and it will really make an impact. And I'm going to stop for just a second and say, and tell you a little story. And this is really deep to me because it just happened really, really recently. I was getting ready to come here. And I had everything all planned, what I was going to do. And my biggest, my biggest thing, I've been very, 
We all have things that we're excited about in our ministry, things that we're good at, right? Well, my thing that even my pastor has said, you know, Ruhu, let's do this, is my ability to, to hang out with the youth I, I, and to use them in my ministry. I have a, a great group of youth leaders. And um, one of them, this last week, I got a telephone call and um, said she's in the hospital. She's been taken to the ER and she tried to kill herself. And um, you have to understand, she's really close to me. And it was a shock because I honestly, I knew that there were issues. But I thought that she was, like, the last month had been awesome. The last three months had been awesome. Like, she was really seeming to do great. And I guess sometimes they say, you know, that the biggest part of the storm is before you hit that boom. And she was in the eye of her storm. And... I was like, oh my goodness. And then come to find out that she had some really major identity issues going on and some really major things going on in her life. And so I kind of stood there in shock, just going, what do you do? And her mom said, I don't want you to come because if she knows that I told you, look how she responded when I found out. She tried to kill herself, and she said, you know what, Amy, I think at times she looks up to you more than she does to me, and I don't want you to come. And I will, like, I sat on my bed, and I cried, and I told my husband, I'm like, man, you were like a winner that night, because he just was, like, there for me, and, like, you can't give up on, on I was really going, Lord, if, if this, I thought she was okay. I thought emotionally and psychologically that she was okay, but she wasn't. So, you have to be really careful with your adolescents and your teens. But you also have to know, and this is what I've learned this week, that you can't fix their problems, and sometimes you won't see them. But don't not use them. There was nothing more reassuring last night than hearing from Berlin Fosner that, you know what, it's okay to love on the ones who are broken. That it's okay to to pull them in because you have to love them through their sin and through their, and I needed to hear that. And God is so good and we can trust him. But if you can pull in these youth and you can say, I'm going to be okay if I haven't gone through the, um, there's going to be a backlash that comes with, why isn't so-and-so in the ministry anymore? Because she needs to take a break because she does a lot of hands-on on on stage stuff with with the kids the kids are going to notice that as she's getting healthy she's not going to be there you have to be willing that you're going to be able to take the backlash but youth want to be used they want you to use them I probably went a little bit into my my end stuff there but you know we just say it as it is right okay With the right amount of encouragement, your adolescence will be your biggest asset. I'm going to say that 65 to 70% of my ministry is led by youth. And I don't know what I would do without them. (laughs) What would I do if I didn't have, they're better with the kids than the adults are because they've been at their level not that long ago. They're, they have way, like this amount of enthusiasm and and energy that is awesome, so use them. If they want to be used, use them. All right, so what now? How do these environmental stages affect the spiritual formation of our students? How do we as pastors and children's leaders reach these kids? How do we meet them at the point where they're going to hear and they're going to receive what we have to say? How do we go beyond teaching the Bible for its content, but also instilling in, in these students' core values of where we want them to stay, what we want them to do? Don't we want the best for all of these kids? And man, it hurts It hurts when they decide not to come to church anymore. It hurts when all of a sudden they fall off the, well, I'm a sixth grader and now I'm too cool for church anymore. How do you get it from their brain to their heart that there's a reason and there's there's life in this? How do you teach them that? So we're going to look at some ways that we can accomplish this. All right, in your nursery, this is probably the easiest one. And you can read all of this, but basically happy parents equal happy leaders equal happy babies. And I'm going to say that I think the key to having a happy nursery is who in the world you have in there. You, are, you want to make sure that your nursery leaders are loving, kind, and clean. 
that they're not yelling, they're not using profanity, that they brush their teeth. I mean, I know that sounds like a crazy, but who wants to drop their beautiful little infant in with someone whose teeth are falling out or who haven't shown that they care about themselves? Not in a way, I mean, they, there's all sorts of reasons why people have what they have. But I'm just, I'm saying that person who doesn't bathe and that person who doesn't pour forth, if they don't care about themselves, it's going to be harder for them to care about the babies. And maybe it's not telling that person, I don't want you in here, but having a conversation explaining that to them. I think it's really easy to say, ooh, I don't want to deal with that person. But that is the wrong way to go about it. You need to be willing to have the hard conversations sometimes with leaders because they might need to be a leader just as much as you need them in your ministry. And sometimes it's just a simple conversation that can change everything. So really be careful of who you put, how they speak to the kids, how they talk to each other in the room. Because you never know when a parent is listening right outside the door. And little ones absorb everything. And ultimately, God is watching. So just, you know, yeah. All right. Preschool. What makes a good leader in preschool? You need to find that person who's willing to give the children choices and formulate guidelines. <sighs> Having that dictator in a preschool doesn't work. It doesn't. Because preschoolers are everywhere. They've got these crazy little minds that want to do crazy little things. And if, if they're just upset, it doesn't work. So you need to formulate guidelines and have a person in there who's willing to do that. Um, they need to be willing to develop consistent, loving discipline. That's a big one. They can't just get away with everything or they will walk all over you. They'll walk all over your leader and you will have chaos. And how many of you guys have ever walked into a preschool room that's in chaos? Not a really good idea because someone's going to what? Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get hurt and then you've got a whole other set of issues. But if you just, if you can keep sweet, loving, and caring discipline that says we're going to keep this at a calm level, you're going to have so much more success in your preschool. Okay, somebody who needs to convey respect, self-worth, and love to the children, thereby enhancing the child's self-esteem. We looked back earlier. They are developing in preschool. They are developing the beginning stages of that self-esteem. Well, they begin it in, in infancy, but then it carries through. Who loves me? Who cares about me? How far can I push them? Can I push them to the, the point where they won't want me anymore? We've all had that student. That's awesome and fun. Anyway, but some of them, maybe they're not, you know what that says? Maybe they're not getting it at home. And maybe they just need a hug. And as you start to build those relationships, even with those little preschoolers, you start to see them shine. It's a wonderful thing. All right, you need to hold the children accountable, but you also need to hold your leaders accountable for what they're saying in front of the children. And um, they need to let reality be their teacher. You, they have to have realistic goals for how that class is going to go. Is there times where that class is going to be crazy? More than likely, yes. If you have somebody in there who can't handle any chaos, they probably should never set foot in a preschool room or a nursery for that matter because there's moments where everybody decides to cry. <laughs> I, you know, that's when they're like, Pastor Amy, you know, and I run and end up getting somebody's parent at some point or whatever. But you have to be willing to, to, Say, it's okay. It's okay if I have to go get John's mom for five minutes so that, that John's mom can calm him down. There's no, there's no shame in that. There's nothing wrong with that. I always try to work it out first because that may, John's mom may be completely and utterly done with John right now and can't deal with it herself. We're going to try to deal with the situation here first. But there sometimes does come a point where you just, you have to get a little bit of help. All right, school-age kids. This is what they long for. And um, this is in my experience. I didn't get this off of any website. This is, just, um, this is just Amy learning over the years, doing some research and saying, you know what, this is what kids want. They want relationship with people the, and with Christ. But if they don't get that relationship with people, they're not going to have that relationship with Christ. They want to know you. They want you to be fun. They want to, you to be open and honest with them. And if you have fun with them and you're open and, and you just get down there and at their level, when it comes time to sit, and I, used, I had trouble with this in the beginning of my ministry. This is my 12th year doing children's ministries, and I did end up being a teacher before that. So I did six years of teaching, and then I, um, I realized that I didn't need to be a counselor 
that I needed to be a pastor because that's what God called me to do. And so, but in that time, I really learned that kids want relationship with you. Kids need grace. School-age kids especially, man, they need grace. They need to know that I'm going to forgive you when you mess up and that it's okay. Kids need to know what God wants from them. They want to know, you know, it's really easy to walk into a a place and just expect that everybody's read the Bible. But once again, they don't all have that knowledge. They didn't all grow up in church and you're going to get kids of all kinds. They they do not understand that when you talk, I should sit. They do not understand that um, it's not okay to stand on my seat or put my head in between my legs or, you know, whatever, to do crazy things while you're talking. They don't get that. They don't understand church etiquette that, that we have. They don't understand that church ease, those words that we use, the things that we tell them about being respectful to God and this and that. You really have to be willing to say, okay, you know what? This is what I expect. This is, lay down your rules, but don't make them so complicated that they don't, under, that they don't understand. Talk on their level and get down, down with them. And, and simple is more. To get you, pick you, what you, what do you want to teach them? Teach them that. And don't try to beat all around the bush and every other thing that you want them to learn. Because they want to know what God wants from them, and it's your job to teach them that. All right. They want to understand deep things. Sometimes it's okay to take a deep concept. What did I teach on on Sunday? Because I can't remember. I taught about salvation, but I used a word. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. But it was a big word, and now I can't even remember it. That's awesome because my brain is just maybe a little fried. I don't know. But it is okay to take big concepts like the adoption of, of, of yourself by Christ or what is um, reformation or what is reconciliation. These words, and teach them. Don't just use the words, but then teach them what do these words mean. And kids love, if there's a big word and you have them say it, 10 times during the service and they learn the definition of it. They learn how it applies to the Bible. They really think it's cool and it makes you look good when they go back and they use this big word with their parents after service and you're like, dude, how in the world did you teach Johnny about reconciliation? That's amazing. No, but you know, they want to learn deep things. They want to know. Um, They want to be educated and they want to be accepted by you and they want to be accepted by the group and I talk a lot with with my group about in this place it's safe we're not going to make fun of people here we're not going we're going to accept everyone we're going to encourage everyone and they want independence they want things that they can do themselves so however that looks to you in your ministry just make sure that it happens what do teenagers need teenagers can be some of the absolute best children's ministries leaders if those teens our students that have come through your ministry, they're even better because they know it. They understand it. I don't have to tell my student leaders anymore. We may come in and do a, you know, okay, this is what we're doing today. This is our breakout groups. This is, you know, where this is what we're going to do here, here, and here. But I don't have to give them, okay, this is the philosophy of my ministry. They don't need it. They've been there. We might have it in a meeting you know, once a year, but it's not something that I constantly have to remind them. They lived it. They know what the point is. They know what we're doing there. They are awesome leaders. They're an asset to you. What do they need? They want to be a part of your community. They need grace. They have to have purpose. I've had it before where three extra students will come in and they'll just want to, oh, can I please help out today, Pastor Amy? And I have learned to say no. Because a student in the back of your room with no purpose, if you did not plan for them, they will stand back and they will interrupt. They will talk to their friends. They will be disruptive. And I've learned to say, no, would you like, do you want to be on another week? Do you, what, are you looking to be more involved in children's ministries? Because maybe we need something on our Wednesday night program. Or I would love to plug you in. But I really stick to my schedule. And it has been so much better. Like just two or three years ago, I was, I was a pushover. Oh, you're having a hard, it's a hard day. Oh, come, sure, come on in. We'll take care of you. But I learned it doesn't help. It's not helpful. As a matter of fact, it makes me crazy. So if I don't want to be crazy, then I need to not let them come in if they're not on the list. And actually, it's not doing them any good. 
They're going to stand back and they're going to get glared at from you. Maybe even they're going to push you to the point where you call them out in front of everybody. And there's no part of that that's helpful to them. So send them to service to go learn something. Go learn something. All right. They need encouragement after you tell them that you don't want them. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. You need to encourage them. And there are great ways to do that. And I'm, I'm sure that you can think of something awesome. I know that I love to give them little, little notes. I love to post on their Facebook pages. Um, I am kind of the queen of little presents. I, and, and maybe you don't have that in your budget, but it's not that expensive. I love to, I'll do like, cool, if I find cool suckers, I love cool suckers. So I might, if they're on clearance and I might pick them up, you know, they're 25 cents a piece and they were originally two bucks. I look for these kind of things. Um, I might buy them all. And then I'll just over the next, <laughs> I'm really bad. I'm like a clutter. My basement is ridiculous. Anyway, but I love to do this kind of stuff. And I probably drive my husband crazy because I am like a hoarder of little crazy things. But you know what? It makes their day to get a little gift. And if I can find it in a way where I didn't really have to put a lot into it, they don't need to know that. <laughs> Hopefully none of my students listen to this. Anyway, but um. <laughs> The things we don't think about. Anyway, but really, truly, little gifts are great. Any kind of way that you can encourage them and say, you know what? I think you're awesome and I appreciate you. And um, yeah, you can, the same thing goes, this isn't part of my thing, but the same thing goes with your leaders, your adult leaders. Man, they love to be appreciated. They really do. You like to be appreciated, right? Even if it's something that you don't even want, it's really cool to know, oh, but they thought of me. It's a happy thing. Okay. They need discipleship. <sighs> And they need to understand that there are, there, there's a plan. There is something that we are trying to teach these kids. And as you're using youth, youth as your leaders, you have to get through their head that there is a code of conduct. I do this group called BLAST, and actually we never did contracts this year. But this group called BLAST, it's Believers Living and Something Together, Serving. Believers living and serving together. And um, this BLAST group is the group that does a lot of fine arts stuff. And I'm in charge of that at my church. And so they sing and do drama and like that kind of stuff. And it's a really fun group. It's, it is. it is, But except for this year, I, th they have to sign a thing that says, you know what? I am not going to be that student at school that's sleeping around. And I am not going to be that student at school that's dropping the F-bomb every five minutes. I'm not going to be drinking, and I'm not going to be doing marijuana, and I'm not going to be smoking. This is, these are what I'm going to say I am not doing. Because, because not only am I ministering, but there is a group of little people that are watching me, and I am responsible, and I am held accountable to God. And they have to live within a code of conduct. And nowadays, there may be some new things that I have to add to that code of conduct. But I need them to understand that in order to be a part of my team, which it is a coveted place to be. They want to be on the team. They want to do it. So you have to hold up some certain things. And if you're not willing to do it, then you really probably, this might not be the place for you. So sometimes making those hard calls. But I would say, number one, they just want to know that you love them. And that is, that is really big. And it feeds right into that. Remember where their brain is? They're in the middle of, of self-identity. Who am I? What do I believe about God? What do I believe about this? What is this world doing? And I'm getting ready to move out from under that place where my parents take care of everything. I don't know how to do it, but I, I, I just want to know that there's somebody who cares about me. It's going to walk me through this. Isn't going to drop me just because they need us to love and support them. It's it's crucial, and it's crucial to keeping them going to church from adolescence into college. And then you hope that your college group has that same mentality, and then getting them from college into that young marrieds group. You, you need to, and some of those people, I mean, those, those students that I had 12 years ago are starting to get married now. And um, one of them, unfortunately, is even getting a divorce. It's, it's been a month, I'm telling you. But... They will still come to you. They will still need you. And you will always be older than them because, unfortunately, we age. And, you know, now as I'm in my 40s, I'm starting to see that, that children's ministries looks different than it did when I was 25 or 30. It really does. It, it's, it's become a, 
partnership and a mentorship, but it starts when you're that 18 year old saying children's ministries is what I want to do and I'm going to do this and you learn lessons along the way. And if there's any part of this where you can take and say, man, that's something that I'm not doing or that's something that I need to do better. Man, the faster you grow, the the more um, efficient you become and it's a good thing. All right, so we know that our students need us. We know how to develop and execute this plan, some things that we need to do, and it will, it, it will improve our chances, um, and the student will understand and accept the gospel, and there's, there's kind of a to-do list. If you're doing these things, then it will really help you. Number one, you have to have a clear goal. What is my point? As a children's leader, what do I want them to gain while they're in here? Number one, I want them to get saved. Number two, I want them to become a productive citizen. And number three, I want them then to tell others about Jesus. So if you, that's my goal. I I want to lead them to Christ. I want them to have a set of standards and morals that says I'm going to, I'm going to be a good citizen. And then I'm going to move from there and I'm going to tell other people about Jesus and bring them along the way. That's my goal. And I am passionate about it. I believe in what I'm doing. If Students will see right through you if you have no passion. If you don't really want to be there, they're going to know. And maybe you're in a rough season right now, and it's time to say, okay, Lord, I need fresh passion. I need a fresh encouragement. I need you. And take that time and fill me up, Lord. Fill me up because I'm dry. And he will. I've been there. I've been dry. I have been in that valley time. And God revives your passion, and there it is. Number three, you've got to be authentic. You cannot tell them one thing and do another. If your kids see you in the neighborhood bar, you're going to have a problem. If they see you in your car with your vaporizer, you're going to have issues. You know, if (laughs) we all know that as a pastor, as a leader, as a children's ministry, you need your own code of morals, your own code of conduct, because isn't that what God has called us into? But it's the little things, too. It's how we're speaking and the words that are coming out of our mouth. It's when I show kindness to somebody who doesn't deserve it. And they're going to see those little things. Those little things are going to become the big things. And they create who I am as a core person. Be real. Don't fake it. You know, fake it till you make it, maybe in the beginning. But after you get established, you just do it. Don't fake it. Do it. And make it real. And then work on building relationships. I've gotten to wear some of my best times. I actually have a budget item now, a coffee, a coffee line. I have a coffee budget. It's awesome. And I found this is a really important thing in my ministry because students, even your third, fourth, and fifth graders, if you have that kind of rapport and relationship with them where you're building them and maybe you've got a relationship with their parents now and you pick them up and you take them to Starbucks, that is cool. They love it. They love it. And it's one-on-one relationship building time with you. It's an essential part of your ministry. And maybe you're not a coffee drinker and that's fine. Maybe it's, maybe it's these five kids are your core little team and you're going to, not, not your leader team, but your core team of students and you're going to take them to the park. You're going to take them to the movies. <laughs> I realize that I have a great, I, I, am, I am so blessed to have a pastor who supports children's ministries. And when I say, I want to take a group of kids to the movies because they did this, this, and this. He says, sweet, go for it. And it's awesome. Not all of us have that. But there are things that we can do that are free. Parks are free. Kids love to hang out together. Maybe you're close to a beach and you can take them to a beach day and they think that is phenomenal. Kids, they don't care if you're dropping money on them. They really don't. They want you. They want your heart. They want you to listen to them. Build relationships and make them real. All right, I'm going to close with this, and then if you have any questions, I want you to remember that ultimately, and this is, I feel like I really learned this lesson this week, that the outcome of your ministry is in God's hands. And sometimes it's not going to go the way that you think it could, it should. Sometimes you're going to struggle and not have enough leaders. Sometimes pillars of your church are going to make mistakes, and you have to answer questions from kids. There is all sorts of things as leaders that we go through. But the key is to remember and I love this quote by Mark Batterson, I have an unshakable sense of destiny because I know that as long as I pursue God's calling on my life, then God is ultimately responsible for getting me where he wants me to be. 
And that's what we need to remember, that he is in charge of it all.